Take one. Hello, Rinpoche. I am here to praise and congratulate the venerable eminence Samdong Rinpoche, uh, the, one of the most remarkable Tibetan reincarnate lamas on the occasion of his birthday. Maybe late 80s. I'm not sure, actually, as it turns out. But doesn't matter. He deserves tremendous congratulations anyway. I first met Samdong Rinpoche in 1964 when I was in Dharamsala, India, when it was a much different town than it is now, tiny little town. And we lived in the same kind of a hut made of, the outer walls were made of five gallon ghee tins pounded flat. The inner partitions were made of cardboard. The roof was a, a tin roof, you know, solid, good, rainproof, so tin roof, and uh, held up on pillars. And quite cold and snowy in winter, which Dharamsala is not any longer so much. Rarely that you get that cold. 1964, that's 59 years ago. And uh, he was working on a dictionary it was the main tenant or the boss of the house was someone called Dayab Rinpoche, uh, a great lama himself from Eastern Tibet, still alive, uh, has worked for years in Germany in the university system. And now he's retired there and started a Tibet house, Deutschland, Tibet house, Deutschland in uh, Frankfurt, and another, I think, in Berlin. And um, I really like Sandor Rinpoche. He was uh, very scholarly and studious and uh, very serious, and working on a dictionary, which later became a standard dictionary, Tibetan-Tibetan, I think Tibetan-Tibetan dictionary, not Tibetan-English. And uh, since then, uh, you know, we, we have not been that close because both of us are working hard in many different things, but we've remained good friends for all these 60 years. And, um, I admire him so much, and he's extraordinary among Tibetan lamas. He started in India something called the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, CIHTS, with the blessings and funding of the Indian government. And um, it was for training in Tibetan learning and knowledge. Um, all Tibetan speaking and culturally Tibetan uh, peoples within the Indian Himalayas like in Ladakh, Spiti, in Arunachal Pradesh, which in those days was called Nepal, Northeast Frontier Area, uh, Sikkim, Darjeeling, all of these sort of places, and many from Nepal, and some exile, of course, ones who had come from all sorts of parts of Tibet. And um, as it grew in stature and in productivity over the years, uh, it was affiliated initially with the Sanskrit Varanasi University, and um, it was it was a wonderful thing. And and about 10, 15 years ago, it was it was formally became a central university of Tibetan studies, so funded supported by the Indian government. And lately, I'm not sure the status whether it reverted to the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, but whatever the formal name is, and category in the Indian bureaucracy, it is the principal institution of learning in India. Uh, for Tibetan Buddhist science, Tibetan Buddhist philosophy, Tibetan Buddhist language and literature, uh, all the different uh, religions in Tibet, Ban religion, uh, Tibetan Islam, you know, the little bit that there is, Tibetan Christianity, the little bit that there is. And since the modern Tibetan government, which has been in exile since the communist takeover in 1959, 60, um, only it's only been exiled because the communists only have the religion of communism. They are a religious state where you have to have the ideology of communism as your principal religion. You're not allowed to have, they have different times for as cultural preservation. They've allowed some kind of forms to be preserved in Tibet. And for tourism, they allowed some monasteries after having destroyed over 6,000 of them, they allowed a few hundred to be rebuilt to become magnets for tourism, but they don't really allow the study of Buddhism, the practice of Buddhism. And actually lately they've gone really berserk again 
preventing Tibetan children from learning the Tibetan language, putting them in Chinese speaking and teaching boarding schools, over a million, almost a million children, and uh, taking the word Tibet off their maps. So they, they call it by the Chinese name Shizang, uh, and really going for ethnocide, if not genocide, which of course turns into genocide if successful, since the people in question lose their culture and lose their sense of identity a relative identity as being a member of the Tibetan heritage and nation. So Chandra Rinpoche created the most marvelous thing. And also among Tibetan exile lamas, aside from the Dalai Lama, he's really the only significant one who had major friendships among Indian intellectuals and the Indian intelligentsia, as well as government people, which is how he created that institute. And at one point, actually, he was asked by the great Krishnamurti to be Krishnamurti's successor teaching in, in, in Krishnamurti's non-order order. order. Uh, I don't have time to go into Krishnamurti's uh, complex thing, but he was really basically a, a, an inner science teacher without sectarian uh, affiliation after his rebellion against being promoted as some kind of Amazing avatar, you know, even in his youth, a marvelous man. Anyway, he asked Samdhan Rinpoche, he chose Samdhan Rinpoche to be a, a kind of successor of him in that tradition because of their very powerful meeting of minds that they held over the years. But Rinpoche was not able to accept that, which would, get, would have given him a remarkable international role, actually, as an intellectual. But um, he wasn't in a position to accept it because he had to serve Tibetan government in exile, had to serve his holiness, the Dalai Lama. And he had to, you know, serve the Tibetan people, and then, um, and he wrote books, and he taught us all a lot of things. I learned a lot of things from him, although I was never directly in a class with him, but I learned a great deal from him over the years. And then he did something really remarkable for Lama. That is, he when, when the Tibetan uh, constitution of the government in exile was finalized about twenty years ago, a little bit more than twenty years ago where the leader became like a president rather than a prime minister appointed by Dalai Lama. But actually, they went full on democratic, which Dalai Lama was very proud of that he did. they did that. And he ran for the presidency, or they may have called it still prime minister at that time, but he ran for that. And he won that. And he served two terms as the prime minister of the government in exile, which is the sort of highest political figure in the Tibetan world community. Because even though there's only 130, maybe 150,000 Tibetans in exile, and there are 6 million left in Tibet, which they were before. In other words, so many were killed that they don't, they did not see any growth in population over the last 60 years, which is very unusual. But they didn't because many were killed in the Chinese uh, oppression, the, the initial invasion and the occupation and sterilization programs, all sorts of terrible things that the world does not know that are equivalent to Russia with the Ukrainians, with, you know, the, the right-wing uh, settlers with the Palestinians, very equivalent, you know, this kind of uh, uh, oppression of a people to get their land, you know, which is what's, which should not be going on in a post-United Nations world, but does. So, you know, by Afrans, you know, there's all kinds of them. So, uh, you know, not allowing self-determination, in other words, to people who have their own land and their own cultural nation and so on. Uh, some imperial, quote unquote, liberating communist or capitalist country does that. So anyway, so uh, um, too many cases on the planet still. But this will come to an end because it's not viable in a modern culture. And Rinpoche is one of the great teachers of that. And... Um, so, so then he, in other words, he took responsibility as a Buddhist monk, keeping his Buddhist vows, keeping his Buddhist meditative and philosophical discipline and his great enlightened insight. And he served politically to sort of try to reorganize Tibetan government in exile to help the negotiation with Chinese, which turned out to be fruitless because it, like, they're not interested in negotiating with any real Tibetans. And it has proven that. But anyway, he tried to do that because of Dalai Lama's nonviolent, what he calls middle way approach. And he still tries to help Dalai Lama now in his post. Uh, he's he's, he's uh, two terms, he's not been prime minister. He's not, he's had a two term limit and he kept to that. 
So he's just a marvelous person, Samdhan Rinpoche, one of the great figures in the history of the Tibetan diaspora. He will be considered one of the great figures. And he deserves the most hearty congratulations on his birthday, which I'm very happy to send to you. I missed the party that was given for you by the Tibetan American community in, in New York I, because of my own old age and being retired. But um, I'm therefore making this and I will send it to them. I will send it to you personally. And um, I hope it will stand as part of the record of what a wonderful person I consider you to be from my own humble position of looking at the Tibetan history of the recent time and also being able to evaluate your sort of spiritual attainment also from a humble perspective, not in a way it's equal, but still seeing how eminent you are and how important your teachings have been. So thank you so much and all the best and many happy returns. I look forward to celebrating many further birthdays of yours and have a long life and a good health and a prosperous and a fruitful time. Thank you, thank you, sir, uh, Professor. You're so well, so famous in India, you were just known as Professor S. Rinpoche. Everyone knew you as just S. Period Rinpoche. So Professor S. Rinpoche, your eminence, uh, congratulations and happy birthday. Cut. 15 minutes.